One of the things that years ago that when we were trying to understand these through the National Plaster Council, we decided to do research and we decided that let's take a swimming pool because we know and we're, we're very, very forthright about this. Look, you can make little coupons in a petri dish and throw them in a fish tank in somebody's basement. That's not real science. Come on, guys. If, if you want to see or understand more about nodules, nodules, do a pool in actual fill conditions. Get a pool that's actually pool size. Treat it a certain way. Then you're duplicating what happens in reality out in the field. And so to that end, what we did was we took a swimming pool and this was located at a and a which is part of Shasta Pools, and we broke this pool into three different sections. We multi-coated it, which is a bond coat type membrane over an existing surface, and we had towel, in essence, racing lanes breaking up the three sections, put in three different types of materials, and so that we could say that not any one section, well, every section was different from the other sections, and then we trialed to pull back in with these three different types of material. Then what actually happened was as we did that, we, we then started up the pool and then we very quickly made the water corrosive and it would, would basically go from a corrosive etching condition, leaching condition, to a precipitative condition or a scale forming condition. So we alternated the chemistry. And sure enough, and remember, three different sections, we grew nodules in all three of these sections. And again, all three sections, different materials. So there are no two sections are the same. After about uh, a year, we drained it to analyze it. Well, first thing we did was we generated etching deterioration or spot etching in it. So we did that first. And we knew that was probably gonna happen because of the low carbonate alkalinity. Then the next thing that we did is we grew nodules in all three sections. And these are not little bumps, but we actually grew 50 cent size, as you will see in the photograph, nodules on this. In this first slide, this is the section, this is section number one. You can actually see the size of the nodule going out of, on the wall. Now this particular nodule was different from the other two sections in that this nodule at this location had a delamination. How do we know that? Because when we drained it, we tap tested it. There was no bowing or blistering or anything of that, but we knew by tap testing it, it was hollow. So we knew in this particular one, there was a delamination. And when we cut it to cut it out, remove it, we cut a square. And as we cut the square at the bottom underneath the nodule to remove it, water would run out. So we knew that water had, getting, had gotten back behind this particular nodule growth site. And one of the things that we did, we removed this section and we wanted to analyze this nodule, so we removed it for analysis. And one of the things that we noticed was that even though the, the plaster itself was intact, that water had gone through and gone through a microfissure, a pathway into the matrix, and subsequently began to crystallize, not just at the surface with a deposit, but also on the back side. And I tell people that when nodules form in some cases because of the pressure they exert, they're able to shatter plaster. And people go, well, I don't understand how crystallization pressure can shatter something or cause it to crack or expand and delaminate, that kind of thing. And the example I use is, I, I prove it to homeowners real simple. And the way I do that is I go, if you don't think crystallization pressure can exert tremendous force, I said, let me take your radiator off your car, which is steel, I'll fill it with water, and let me put it in a freezer and freeze it. I said, do you know what that ice will do as it crystallizes, it expands, it will shatter or crack steel. And that's just from crystallization pressure. So crystallization pressure, and in nature, salts can generate a lot of crystallization pressure. And one of the things that we see sometimes is that nodules, not all cases, but in some, can actually you know, crack the plaster and cause it to uh, expand and separate. The next slide and to the right of the pipe, you will actually see a small nodule. And this section is so interesting because at this section we had no delamination. This section, it was perfectly sound, hard bonded. Now again, a second set of material. There was no separation here. Uh, we tap tested it, it was at a nice sound, solid sound. 
but you can clearly see there is a nodule growing there, a different set of cement, a different set of sand, uh, different finish or finish this section than the other section. Yet we have the growth. And once again, the common denominator here is the condition of the water on all three sections was the same for all three sections. In this slide, you can see that we actually have cut the nodule away. And, and the reason we did that, because one of the things that we know sometimes about nodules is so interesting, you can cut them away and patch them and you'll get a nodule grow right back in almost the exact same spot or in the same patch. And they'll grow at the edges of the patch, they'll, they'll come back at the patch itself. And to prove that, I included a photograph where this pool was later, we plastered that patch in and guess what happened? The nodule grew back in that patched area. We had another, another calcium grow in that patched area. Again, that's why I said right at the beginning, Nodules are these extraordinary phenomena. There's sometimes no tried and true reason for them, but you got to deal with them on a case-by-case -case basis because they are extraordinary. Um, sometimes the growths, again, will pick up uh, metals or other things in the water like calcium and precipitate, sediment, and they'll be incorporated into the actual growth itself. One of the things that we did when we were doing the work in the Arizona test pool was we wanted to apply some laboratory techniques. So what we did is we would cut out nodules, uh, cut out sections with nodules, and in this example here we would apply two different uh, techniques that are very, very commonly used in science uh, for uh, petrographic analysis, and that's called scanning electron microscopy, a very recognized technique, and energy dispersive spectrometry. And those are to do two things, to give us a microscopic look at what's going on down inside that section to see things we cannot see with the naked eye. And number two, by using EDS, the energy dispersed spectrometry, to tell us what is the exact chemical makeup of that nodule? What is that? What is it? We've had a lot of theories. In this shot, you can actually see, and this is one of the best shots, on the top of the uh, surface of the plaster, you can actually see a little like honeycombing. And then you have this growth up here. That's the actual nodule. But the parts that's so fascinating about this is coming down from the nodule, there is a little microfissure, and it is a microfissure running down that's only a couple microns wide. That's the width of a human hair. And you got this little microfissure leading down into a void. Okay, so this is definitely one type of nodule. And so we took the scanning electron microscope and we wanted to learn more. And there is another blow-up shot of the nodule itself. And you can actually see this little pathway down, and there's a, a void. And inside that void, we began to realize that there was other things inside that void. And the thing that we found that was most prominent were these platelets of what's called calcium hydroxide crystals. Calcium hydroxide, if you, whenever you mix white cement with water, uh, you produce many, many new cement compounds. But the one that's the most common is a thing called calcium hydroxide. Either directly or indirectly from mixing white cement with water, 27%, 24 to 27% of what you form is calcium hydroxide. Calcium hydroxide can be form, found in voids and can be found at interfaces. In interfaces, they're called ITZs, interfacial transition zones, if my hand is an aggregate the, where the cement paste encapsulates that, there's a special region, usually anywhere from 20 to 50 micrometers in size, where you get a different composition. You get greater porosity, it's got a high localized water cement ratio, but that's where calcium hydroxide is found. It's also found in the bulk cement paste, but this photomicrograph clearly shows what calcium hydroxide crystals look like. And we went to great length to zoom into this void to see what was in there. And what we found was something so extra, extraordinary. You can see these platelets of calcium hydroxide. These large look like uh, 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 actual cleaved plane of material. And then in some of them what we found is that the, the, the calcium hydroxide platelets are breaking down or dissolving. They're actually being affected and breaking down. And these photographs, uh, this particular uh, photomicrograph that we took, this is work that we did back in the 80s. This particular pool was 1993. 
People always ask me, how long have you been looking at nodules? And I'll tell people pretty much all my adult life. And I started in the business in 1969, and I'm still looking and learning more and more about nodules. And one of the things that in, there, in this particular photomicrograph, you can actually see that the calcium hydroxide platelet is actually deteriorating and breaking down. Those spiky looking uh, little, they look like little uh, probes uh, sticking up like that, are a product called Etronite. And that's something else that you will find in many cases in a void. Uh, this particular screen, what you're seeing is this is the interior, the, the, the testing are using EDS, energy dispersive spectrometry, to figure out what is the composition of this material. We know they're calcium carbonate. It's been tested and proven time after time they're calcium carbonate. People go, what is that? I go, well, if you've ever eaten a Tums, Tums is an example of calcium carbonate. So it is something that exists in nature, but it forms. Uh, calcium carbonate is also the aggregate of plaster pools. It's marble sand or limestone sand. So we use scanning electron microscopy. We know an EDS to prove that we can look at these things super magnified. We also know from EDS that they are calcium carbonate in nature. Okay. The next technique that we wanted to employ was optical microscopy. And previously I had shown that pool with the blue nodules. They looked like little blue worms growing on that white fabric glass surface. So we decided, let's utilize another technique. Let's use optical microscopy. And we took that fiberglass coated plaster surface that we had shown earlier and we went to the site of one of those blue looking worm like things and we decided let's cut out and remove one and see what we can find underneath that blue worm. The calcium growth that with gravity is growing in a linear fashion. In this slide you can actually see we're cutting it. We took uh, four inch diamond blades on a Makita and cut it and we're going to remove that entire section all the way down to the shotcrete and then look at it. This first photograph uh, is of, of, of a growth that we found on the fiberglass surface. And now we're becoming intrigued because, you know, this quote is not a, if this is just a plaster phenomenon, we've, as we said, we find them growing on everything. Here is literally a coating that's been fiberglass coated, and yet we have the same phenomenon on it, the nodules. And you can see they grow, and there's where it's actually, the blue is where it's picked up the copper ions, and you can actually see that it is blue in color. But now is where it gets fascinating, because what did we find underneath these blue growths? We found little pinholes. Again, you cannot see these with the human eye in most cases, but when you look at them under an optical microscope, we could find tiny little pinholes. And in the pinholes were this calcium carbonate material actually growing. And you can actually see as you scrape away and erode away the blue copper uh, carbonate uh, material on the surface, there's that little pinhole. And there's also, we noticed tiny little micro fissures, little tiny cracks that were in the fiberglass that once again, and I got to stress this, were not visible to the human eye. You could not see them. It wasn't until you magnified them tremendously were we able to see these tiny little pinholes and micro fissures. And sure enough, in almost every little pinhole we found in fiberglass, we found blue growth, blue calcium carbonate growth. We even took the sample and were able to flip it over. And if you took this is the outer coating of the fiberglass and you flip it over and you look at it from the backside, you could actually see the hole going through. In this particular shot, you can actually see the mat that's used in the to produce the fiberglass. Fiberglass coating over a plaster surface, but here's where it gets super in, uh, interesting, is that when we looked at the underlying plaster, we found what? So we peeled the fiberglass off. We see the pinhole going through. Here's the top of the plaster. There is a microfissure. There's a crack. And the way that we identified this was in one of these tiny little pinholes that we knew was there. We took a red pigment, a red dye, and we dropped it so that it soaked through that little tiny pinhole, got into the plaster, and worked itself through the fiberglass, and sure enough, penetrated into the microfissure that was in the plaster itself. And you can see it in the photograph. We did a cross section. We took the plaster. So if this is the top of the plaster, what you're seeing in this slide is the side view of the plaster showing 
how the red stain had penetrated through the crack down into the matrix. So we knew that this became our source of the calcium. And now it's why, because here you go, you got plaster, a fiberglass coating over it, but what's still the common denominator? Water, and water especially that's aggressive.